Good day, fellow planeteers. On this channel, we often talk about the connection between international relations and the power of passports. In other words, the extent of your ability to travel is more or less determined by your country's foreign policy. I thought I'll share a couple stories about the Canadian passport today, so that we can have a better look at why some foreign policy issues are affecting the power of this travel document. For the record, I'm not picking on Canada just for shits and giggles. I care about the Canadian passport because one, it's considered one of the best passports, which I don't agree with because there's definitely room for improvement, and two, people think of Canada as this benevolent country that's friendly with everybody, which is not. Not true. So the purpose of this video is really to remind you that there are instances in Canada's diplomatic history where the government fucked up, and there are areas in the world where Canada is not welcomed. I want to give you a full picture of Canada's diplomatic failures instead of this Mr. Nice image that the government is trying to promote. Before we start, let me remind you that a free way to support the channel is to like, subscribe, and share this video on social media if you find it interesting. Now, without further ado, let's go. Canada has always had a rocky relationship with Iran ever since the Islamic fundamentalists took over in 1979, or in the words of the Egyptian president. He calls you Imam. Forgive me, his words, not mine. A lunatic. The most obvious wedge between Canada and Iran was, of course, the role that Canada played during the Iran hostage crisis. When the Iranian students stormed the U.S. embassy in Tehran and captured 52 American diplomats and citizens, during the commotion, six American diplomats escaped to the Canadian embassy. They were later rescued by a joint effort of the American and Canadian governments, using forged Canadian identities. The operation was made into a movie called Argo. Check out that movie if you want to know more about the incident. After successfully getting the six diplomats out, Canada shut down its embassy in Iran ahead of time in fear of retaliation, which means Canada basically committed diplomatic suicide with Iran in order to achieve America's strategic goals. I'm not saying saving six American lives is not important, but making fake Canadian passports on the behest of America only solidified the stereotype that Canada always plays second fiddle to the United States. Which isn't great for the country's image. Ten years after that, Iran and Canada resumed diplomatic relations, but it has always been bugged by issues such as human rights, weapons, sanctions, hostages—you know the usual stuff. Until Canada officially severed diplomatic ties with Iran again in 2012. Therefore, it wouldn't surprise anyone that Iran just doesn't allow Canadians or Americans to come in without a visa, despite issuing visa on arrival to almost everyone else in the world. But Canada's inability to handle Iran cuts deeper beyond visas. In January 2020, the Ukrainian airline 752, a passenger airplane, was shot down by Iranian missiles. 176 people on board, including 55 Canadian citizens, mostly of Iranian background, were killed. In spite of the mounting evidence against Iran, there wasn't much that Canada could do because it didn't even have diplomatic presence, let alone influence, in Iran. The downing of the plane also happened just five days after the United States killed the Iranian general and terrorist supporter Soleimani. So there is a possibility that Iran was hitting back on Canadian civilians for what the U.S. government has done. If that's true, it will be proof for yet again Canada got itself wrapped in the mess that America made. The United Arab Emirates is a country that has built its wealth on oil, but it's also a country that's been aggressively trying to diversify its economy. One of the industries the country was trying to diversify into was the aviation industry, and it has been doing very well. Emirates and Etihad are two of the best airlines in the world, and they are both in the UAE. The rapid development of Dubai and Abu Dhabi also attracted foreign talents from around the world, including Canada. By the early 2000s, there were about 20 to 30 thousand Canadians living in the country. The UAE also became the fourth largest investor in Canada. This much money and people going back and forth between the two countries created a strong demand for direct flights. 
In 1999, UAE and Canada signed an agreement allowing Emirates and Etihad to fly up to six times a week to Canada. In just a few years, those six flights became so popular that they were full almost all the time. That's why since 2005, Emirates and Etihad, with the help of the UAE government, have been lobbying Canada to allow them to fly more direct flights to more destinations. However, this proposal was met with objections from Air Canada, who warned against expanding landing rights to planes from the UAE because, quote, Emirates wanted to flood the Canadian airspace with seats to take more travelers and divert them through Dubai, unquote. In other words, Air Canada was afraid to compete with Emirates and Etihad, which provide better service for lower prices. The Canadian government is always quite keen on protectionism and therefore turned down the UAE's application in 2010. Following the decision, Emirates issued a strongly worded statement refuting Air Canada's concerns while expressing disappointment. However, the matter didn't simply end there. As retribution, the UAE closed its airspace to the Canadian Defence Minister, Peter McKay, who was returning from a three-day visit to Afghanistan. But embarrassing Canada's top military director was only the beginning. UAE's retaliation came in combos. Camp Mirage, a Canadian military base in Dubai, was serving as the logistics station for Canada's operations in Afghanistan at the time and was about to have its lease expired. And after the fallout of the aviation deal, UAE refused to extend the agreement, leading to the closure of the camp and created challenges for transporting equipment and troops. It was also reported that UAE was lobbying other countries to vote against Canada's campaign for a seat at the UN Security Council, Although no official sources have ever confirmed or denied the report, Canada eventually dropped out of the election after falling behind in the first round of voting. To add insult to injury, UAE started requesting visas from Canadians, who up until that point enjoyed visa-free stay in the country. Not only that, the rules for visas are extremely strict and the prices are sky-high. Even after spending up to $1,000 for a visa that's only valid for six months, Canadians can only spend two weeks in the country, making it very inconvenient to visit families and friends. This punitive visa requirement made Canada the only G7 country whose passport cannot enter the UAE without a visa, which was quite a disgrace. But I think the Arabs were only hurting themselves because the policy made it inconvenient for Canadian Instagram models to go to Dubai. It was until three years later, Canada's Foreign Minister John Baird finally reached out to his UAE counterpart to solve this problem. The timing cannot be more conspicuous, as it coincided with Canada cutting ties with Iran. It was quite obvious that Canada was in need of a new partner in the Middle East. Sending John Baird over to mend the relationship is also funny because he was the one that refused to add more flights between the two countries when he was the transportation minister back in 2010. So he was kind of cleaning up his own mess in a way. Over in UAE, Baird had a friendly chat over coffee at a Team Hortons in the Abu Dhabi Mall with the UAE's foreign minister, Sheikh Abu... Uh, that's too long... Prince Abdullah. Following the conversation, Prince Abdullah agreed to restore visa-free treatment towards Canadians. In exchange, Canada needs to offer the latest nuclear technology as part of the deal. With regards to Camp Mirage, the two sides didn't reach an agreement, so that base is gone forever. And what about UAE's initial request to have more flights to Canada? Well, that was eventually achieved in 2018, when Canada granted two more flights each to Emirates and Etihad, making the total number of UAE flights to Canada 10 times a week. Canada also waived visa requirements for UAE passport holders. In a final tally, we can see that not only Canada lost its original position on aviation, it also ended up having to make more concessions to the UAE. And all of this could have been avoided if the government had just simply agreed to allow more airplanes. While I couldn't say the Canadian diplomacy in the Middle East has been a disaster, I wouldn't say it's been a success either. It's gonna be an uphill battle for the Canadian passport to get any better in the Middle East. What do you think of Canada's foreign policy failures? Is there any other famous cases you can think of? Leave a comment below and let me know. Don't forget to like, subscribe and all that stuff. I'll see you in the next one.